Hello, my name is Phoebe Watson and I'm a civil engineer in Arab Ireland. And I'm here to talk to you about a project which we carried out with the Institute of Environmental Hydraulics of the University of Cantabria, where we looked at the modelling of wave overtopping loads on a building behind a rubble man breakwater using a 2D numerical model to calculate these loads and then our interpretation of the loads in the building design. To give you an overview of my presentation, I'll be considering the effects of wave overtopping in buildings as a problem in general, before discussing our real life application with the Greystones Coast Guard building, look at the 2D numerical modelling that was carried out, the results of this modelling and its implications and in interpretation for the building design. Wave overtopping is the result of waves breaking on a coastal defence structure, as most of you know, and the resultant discharge coming over the top of the defence structure and flooding the area behind it. It's an ongoing problem that has multifaceted research continuing globally to understand the behaviour and is also a growing concern as sea level rise has increased the volume of overtopping. The picture you can see in front of you is from a pier not far from our project example in Dunleary in Ireland, where you can see the waves breaking over the top of the structure and flooding the area behind it, as well as in the distance, some of the buildings that were potentially impacted by this. Wave overtopping is usually considered in terms of discharge volumes. The table here tables here on the left are extracted from the Eurotop manual, which gives guidance on calculating overtopping volumes for coastal defence structures and the recommended mean limits for volumes of wave overtopping. As you can see, the most onerous conditions are those for the design of people on a breakwater, as well as the effect on boats or structural building elements behind the breakwater. Because this is how wave overtopping is usually considered, there's very little information on the loading due to wave overtopping, particularly if you're looking at a building structure. The project which we're considering for this particular presentation is the Greystones Coast Guard building, which was a new building to be built behind an existing breakwater. And as you can see from the picture, there's very little room to move the building further away from the crest of the breakwater, which is what our first approach would be in order to mitigate this problem of wave overtopping. The design conditions for the breakwater, which was built fairly recently, um, were available to us. And we, looking at the one in 100 year storm, criteria, you can see that the incident wave height is quite high. A lot of the constraints and limits given in the Eurotop manual are for waves of a height less than three metres, particularly if you're looking at vehicle or pedestrian criteria. To give you a better sense of the geography of this location, Greystones is a small town south of Dublin with a harbour located directly on the Irish Sea, shown here. Based on the information which we had from the design of this breakwater, we knew that the wave overtopping for the 1 in 100 year storm event was about 80 litres per second per metre in a mean discharge. If you compare this to the values on the left from the Eurotop manual, you'll see that this greatly exceeds the recommended tolerances. And therefore, we can see that there's a significant problem with wave overtopping and no way to quantify how the damage this could do. Considering the building design life of 50 years, the breakwater was designed for a 100 year desi design life, whereas the 50 year design life implies that we should be using a reduced storm event as the worst case. This would be the one in 1000 year storm for a 5% exceedance probability. However, that information wasn't available to us, so we adapted our basis of design to look at the 1 in 100 year storm as a live loading case 
which is considered in the Eurocode for building design as a factored load, whereas the one in, 100 year, one in 2000 year storm was taken as a worst case accidental load, which isn't factored. It's also worth noting that the maximum measured horizontal load for the recurve crown wall was 59 kilonewtons per meter from the design of the breakwater, which if you apply that load over the full height and width of the building becomes quite a substantial horizontal load to take into account. For the numerical modelling, we approached IH Cantabria, who carried out a 2D CFD numerical model to simulate the wave structure interaction based on the cross section which we'd provided shown on the screen here. This is a model validated for wave overtopping of rubble man breakwaters and we used three sea states um, considering irregular Johns Hop type waves with four random time series per sea state and we were looking for the wave overtopping pressures calculated on the seaward face and the roof of the building. The sea states considered represented the two design conditions which I just discussed, as well as a reduced wave height and wave period for a minimum freeboard case. In the first model run, IH Cantabria looked at the peak dynamic forces from the pressures, averaging the pressure applied on the face of the building into a point load and calculating the application height of that load. Because as you can imagine, the effect of the application height has a significant impact on the design of the structure. The graphs shown here are the force time series for the horizontal and vertical pressures as we want to consider any forces on the roof as well as forces impacting on the wall. From the force time series we were then able to identify peak wave overtopping events and extract pressure, pressure distribution graphs and we found that the pressure distribution was highly variable even for a single event. So the case in front of you now is one single overtopping event that timestamp is less than two seconds apart and you can see that in one case at one point the pressure is much higher on the roof of the building whereas in another it's concentrated much lower down and this introduces quite a complicated design problem because you don't want to design for both of those loads together but the Dynamic pressures as they are, are extremely high and not suitable for quasi-static design of concrete, which is what we were looking at. I should also say that our building had been designed such that there were no vulnerable elements such as windows facing the sea to be impacted by these pressures. Once we had the 2D modeling results, we then had to consider how we were going to apply these loads to the building design. From the previous slide, you'll know that the force time series was highly variable and that those were applied over a very short duration, as you can see there down on the bottom right. Over on the left is an extract from this time series zoomed into a particular wave event, where you can see that no long, not only is the force impact itself highly variable, the application point of this force varies greatly. So to model this as a point load on a building would be ineffective. We considered looking at a dynamic application of this wave overtopping force, applying it directly to a finite element model, which would be the most accurate way of understanding how the building responds to this load. But there's considerable computational effort required in this due to the variation in application height as well as the various forces involved. To avoid this significant computational effort, we considered an alternative approach where we looked at converting the dynamic loads into quasi-static. To reduce the amount of data handled, we looked at identifying 
significant ev overtopping events which had a major impact on the structure and these were extracted for further consideration. We also checked the duration of the loads and cross-check this against the natural frequency of the structure. We then converted to quasi-static loading by time averaging the loads over once over a second and calculated the maximum pressure envelope per event per node of the model. The graph shown here on the left shows the pressure envelope for a particular selected event within a sea state, which is the one in 2000 year storm event. And the maximum time average pressure during that particular event in each node. In order to further simplify the application of this load for the building design, we then developed a maximum pressure envelope per storm event or per sea state based on the pressure envelopes we had calculated for each of the selected events. What you can see over on the right here is an example of this maximum pressure envelope for the one in 2000 year storm event. And the subsequent range of banded pressures which we developed per meter of the structure and height, which allowed for a more accurate assessment of the building reinforcement and a reduction in the load applied at the top of the building. As a result of this, we had a load that was 65% less than the adjacent crown wall design load, which I discussed at the beginning. And for the one in 2000 year event, this was 40% less than the crown wall design load, because even though the load at the base of the structure was similar, the load application height was greatly reduced. And it's also worth noting that a more detailed analysis of these results could have achieved a greater reduction in the loading, but this wasn't necessary for our building design as we had already achieved a significant reduction, which allowed us to remove any raking piles from the, the design, which were providing support from the horizontal load. Finally, I would like to thank the Office of Public Works for allowing us to use this project example. Thank you for listening.